You have to personally engage your team in the strategy, in decisions. Otherwise, if you're just feeding them a playbook, you're going to feed into the number one reason people leave companies. And this is true, pure source data from Gallup. 80% of the reason people leave companies is their boss. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez, Jr., You're now listening to Selling with Social. There's no recovery from a bad first impression, both in dating and sales. Your sales reps need to sell better and smarter from the onset to ensure a good customer experience. That is why you should visit calidascloud.com forward slash Vengresso to view the webinar recording that will change your perspective on the selling experience and how you can improve. That's calidascloud.com forward slash Vengresso, C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S-C-L-O-U-D.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. And now on to this episode of Selling with Social. My man, Paul Epstein, I am super pumped you're joining me today on Selling with Social. Thank you, man. I'm very excited that you're here with me. Yeah, likewise. Super fired up. So we actually, for those of you that are listening in right now, Paul actually is not only a friend, but was also a client of ours at the San Francisco 49ers. And Paul actually moved on into a brand new role with BWLI. Did I get that right? You did. All right. And now really focus in on helping organizations from a leadership perspective and developing the right types of cultures. And I, I had to have my boy Paul on this podcast here with me all because uh, some of the things that he's doing is pretty amazing. And I, I love sitting and listening to uh, some of the things that one that he did over that San Francisco 49ers and two that he's continued to implement across other organizations. So Paul, welcome to the show and do me a favor Give us a little background about yourself, and then I got a very special question for you. So a background first. Yeah, sure. So California, L.A., born and raised, but uh, through post-USC days, I entered 12 years in the professional sports industry on the business side, uh, heading up revenue teams so your audience is entirely fully aligned with the world that I come from and that I still breathe life into through the leadership and culture space, but we're talking three NBA teams, consulting with the Yankees, the Cowboys, the NFL league office. I spent my last four years of the dozen uh, heading up sales for Levi Stadium and the San Francisco 49ers. So it was an amazing ride. As you can imagine, it had me traveling throughout the globe and literally had the keys to the city. So probably a great question that we'll tackle in the next hour or so is why the heck would you ever move on from something that good? But I could tell you that the leap of faith has worked out tremendously well, and I wouldn't change a thing reflecting black on the uh, 12 years. And I remember the days where uh, we would sit down at uh, Michael Mina's, the restaurant, and yes. uh, we, you started asking questions about moves, ads, and changes to career and life. And, you know, what did I do and how and what you were thinking about? And I'm really proud of you, man, for making that move. That's a big move out of sports and into what you're doing now because of a passion. As you know, we've got sales, we've got sales leaders. We've got marketing folks, sales enablement, business owners that are listening into Selling with Social. So I think the things that you're going to talk about are going to help each one of our listeners, including myself, and as we continue to build out our culture within Vangresso. But before we get into some of those details, do me a favor. I want something juicy. Tell us something nobody (laughs) would know about you by looking at any of your social profiles. Give me something good. All right. You want juice? I got juice. All right. Give me something juicy. Just no confessions. <laughs> I'll try, but no guarantees. So here we go. All right. Number one rule about Vegas is what happens in Vegas. Stays in Vegas. Well, in my case, that wasn't necessarily the case because, uh, and I say this in a super loving way, is 
since Memorial Day of 2011, Vegas is on that weekend where I met my now wife. And so when they say what happens there stays there, no, mine's been riding along my side since 2011. And I couldn't be more excited about that. It's been a tremendous journey, but Vegas will always have a very special place in my heart. And so how did you meet your wife? Like where, where were you guys at? Well, is this a PG movie or what's the rating of this movie? <laughs> uh, Lord, no, mercy. Was, Maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. No, without, the table. without any of the details, I, I'll just say that it was what you would expect from Vegas, which navigated from pool parties to nightclubs to limos. And I, I think I have to stop there. <laughs> All right. We're not going to go any further then. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic, man. All right. So let's talk a little bit about you and where you've gone and really this concept of people centric cultures to deliver intentional business outcomes. Like that's some of the things that you talk about that you're now really focused on with leaders for, from really, really large organizations to also uh, small and mid-sized organizations. So this intentional business outcomes, give me an example of what intentional business outcomes means. Sure. And I'll share it from the most recent market. So I just made a move, but I spent the last handful of years up in the Bay, Silicon Valley specifically. And as you can imagine, Silicon Valley being the innovation capital of the world. And so as I'm up there meeting with tech leaders, asking them, what are the outcomes? What is most important to you? What's keeping you up at night? A lot of what I heard was without new product development, we have nothing to fall back on. And that's specific for the tech space, the product heavy space. So the way we would look at that at the Leadership Institute is we're not going to replace your engineers. You have experts, you have pros, that's your world. Where we come in is we say, what's going to fuel that new product development if that is the secret sauce of your business? And so as we roll it back, we lead to a place of ideation, bricolage, innovation. If you are not sharing your best ideas, if you are not pulling the best ideas from every single level of your organization, it is going to be tough to come up with those ideation sessions and those think tanks that lead to that new product development. So where we come in is we say, now environment to inspire that ideation, which leads to the innovation, which leads to the new product development. And end of the day, what you're going to need in order to accomplish that is a culture of trust. And so we train on trust. And we have a model that will specifically walk through because trust is not a behavior. Culture is the sum total of all behaviors in your organization. So how do you build trust in your company if you want the end game to be new product development? And that's where we start. We go from trust to the environment, to the behaviors that build that trust, to all of the ideation sessions, which ultimately end up at that intentional outcome that in Silicon Valley, as an example, could be looking for. So maybe I probably should have started out with BWLI, uh, the Barry Waymiller Leadership Institute. What is the mission of BWLI? Sure. So think of, we are in the consulting space relative to three things. And the first two is where I expected. And the third has been a new revelation that we're tying it back to. So the first being leadership. We view leaders as the number one driver of all cultures. So leaders being one. Two is the secret sauce of what makes a great culture, what makes it sustainable, what makes it thrive. And then the third is, and this is some of the newer piece that I personally have have seen now stepping into this space full time. How do you tie all of that back to bottom line performance? Because where we come in is we say a people-centric culture. And I think there's a percentage of a business community that will drink that Kool-Aid But then there's a large percentage, a larger percentage that is going to say, brother, we've got a business to run and we view culture as the soft skills of the business. So how do soft skills turn into bottom line performance? And we've really had to wrap our value proposition around all of that. So it's leadership, it's culture, it's optimized performance, all three of those things. How do they live in harmony? So translation then here for especially all the leaders listening in, are you saying that there's a direct correlation between performance of a company 
to the culture and the leadership team of that organization? 100%. And bad culture equals potentially bad performance, bad leadership. I'd love to define this concept of bad culture and bad leadership, but bad culture, bad leadership equals bad performance. You got it. So off the top of my head here, help me define, we have all these leaders that are listening into the podcast right now. Help us define like, what does a bad culture look like? Or what is bad leadership? Or maybe it's not bad, but what are some of the things that people are saying? I've got this problem. How do I fix it? So give me an idea of what bad might look like if you can. Sure. And, and with, before diving into bad, let's just define culture because I think that's an important piece. Culture is this ambiguous concept that you can read a hundred articles and get a hundred different perspectives. What I would share about culture, it is the sum total of all of the behaviors in your organization. So culture is truly what drives your organizational and your strategic outcomes. And we all know about the Drucker quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, the way we've defined it, culture is actually what feeds your strategy. So now that we have that level set, we say, well, clearly culture has to be important. So do we leave it to chance? Of course not. And then you ask, well, what's the number one driver of culture? And we end up at leaders. But here's an interesting stat for you because there's a lot of leaders on your podcast. And this is a scary statistic. 58% of leaders have never received formal leadership training. I absolutely could see that all day long. I mean, I, I spent majority of my career in uh, Fortune 100 organizations. And uh, having moved into that role, I, I was never put into a, a leadership training boot camp, you know, how to instill culture, how to instill good leadership tactics. It was like, you're there and then you're mentored by somebody above you who also was never put through a program like that. And they're mentored by somebody above them who was never put through a program. It was kind of like, it's an eight. You should know it, or you should learn it, or you should read, or I was given a book, right? I was given a book, right. which actually was a really good book. It was uh, Marshall Goldsmith's uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There book. And I was one phenomenal. Of my, one of the books that I actually reference all the time because it was a great book. But anyways, 58%. I mean, I could see that. Yeah. And, and Mario, just to close that thought too, because then you end up with this dilemma of, well, and I'll give you an analogy. And this frankly comes from an old industry of mine, which is sports. Think of the NBA as an example. You're a 30-point-a-game scorer. Does that mean that you're going to be a fantastic coach in the NBA? Nobody would ever make that correlation. I feel like business can learn a lot from sports. Business essentially promotes the best doers, and they bump you up into being a manager of doers, and then 58% never get trained in it. That would never fly as you relate to sports where there could be role players. I'm scoring six points a game, but yet I've got a skill set. I've got the emotional intelligence. I've got that intuition to become a great coach. And there's other players that will never do that. But business, that's where we really come in is we see a gap. We see a void. We see a problem. We say, you're promoting the best doers into formal leadership roles. You're not giving them any support or development, and you just expect them to figure it out. And that's why you'll get a mix. A third of leaders are probably in the good to great category, a third are in the middle, and then a third, just unfortunately, they're on the opposite side. And I'm not one to judge. I'm just here to say that what are we doing from a resource standpoint to support all leaders to become their optimal self and then tie it back to that bottom line performance? Yeah. I mean, you raise a pretty big issue. Like that's the name of the game. You excel, you do great, you uh, get visibility and then you get promoted. And then you're asked to do the same thing with all the people that are underneath you. Right. That's pretty, well, it's not novel concept, but it's pretty bad. Actually, if you think about that, <laughs> that 58% of all the leaders that we've got now, that statistic is that just like a, in general in the U S or globally speaking, or what, what is that? Where's that come uh, from? That's a global statistic and the research point on that career builder, right? They're wow. source. Wow. So yeah, they've, they've done decades of empirical uh, research and, and collected that data. Yeah, amazing. Well, what's interesting though, and I, I want to tie this back actually to your journey, because you were, as we talked about earlier, a former sales leader at the San Francisco 49ers, actually one of our customers uh, for Vingresso. And you went through this leadership training program, actually by BWLI, if I'm not mistaken. And it inspired you to join them 
and now to help other leaders become their best self, as you stated. Is there anything more to the story about this journey that you took? I mean, I think you were inspired because I remember talking about this with you a couple of <laughs> times and uh, it was like uh, you'd gotten new religion, right? So, I mean, talk a little bit about that. Well, you spiked my punch and here we are, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> the cliff notes and uh, the highlights of the journey. So back in 2016, the 49ers being a client of the Leadership Institute, I was in a room of 20 plus executive leaders with the 49ers. And we went through a two day discovery of our why, our individual purpose, and our core values. And one of the biggest transition points from that time was that I started to make really big life decisions through the lens of my values. An example that leads to the rest of the story is I went back to school, never would have done that without discovering those values and putting a language around it. But right now I'm about three quarters of the way through an executive MBA program with Michigan. I do a satellite piece in LA and one of the biggest resources of the program. And frankly, the number one ROI I would share is coaching. I never had a coach in my life up to that point. I had mentors. I had folks I could bounce things off of, but I didn't have a coach I now have two. I have one for my career and one for leadership development. And that career coach took me through a series of questions. And what the bottom line that came out of that conversation was my core value is impact. And she asked me how I felt impact was being lived and fulfilled in my day to day, being a sales leader at the 49ers. And I said, deeply But unfortunately, I could say that short of those in my span of care, which was a few dozen managers and individual contributors in sales, I don't know how much impact I'm making beyond that. And so then I looked at where can I make the biggest impact? What gets me out of bed? What's the personal passion? What is my why and how can I live that? And that's where I took that leap of faith thinking, well, now I can make an impact around the world. Now I can make an impact and share the gift that I got, which was finding my purpose. And so we do purpose work with individuals, with teams, with organizations, with entire companies. And we try to put a common thread through that. And so I always say at the end of those sessions, I thank the audience for letting me live my why. And the hope is that there's somebody else in the audience, similar to what I went through that says, I'm no longer going to look at my professional journey through the surface space, which is responsibility and title and comp. That's how I looked at it my entire journey and had this illumination. I would never tell you that I've gone backwards in those core areas. They still matter, but now I look at it through the lens of impact. So that that's the quick and dirty story of why the leap of faith and what inspired it. Hmm. And I definitely know because over the conversations that we had, uh, the inspiration that you were given behind really trying to find you as an individual and as a leader and how you can make impact. So I I know that that's exactly what you were thinking and how it was impacting you. But now that you are on the other side, right? Meaning you were a student once before, and now you're actually out on the other side, helping organizations, improving leaders and improving culture, which essentially nets out into impacting bottom line performance, right? As what we talked about earlier. To me, sometimes it feels like this is kind of like the pie in the sky type of thing. It's like the wave the magic wand, sprinkle the pixie dust. But I know that there are obviously organizations such as yourself, BWLI and, and, and you, Paul Epstein, you are driving to create a winning culture. Like, Talk about some simple steps. What are some simple steps to being able to create a winning culture if I am a sales leader, a marketing leader, or a CEO listening to this podcast? Or are there like a few things that I can do to make that work better for, for our organization? Sure. And, and so I, I will keep it as simple as possible, but I think one of the most important pieces of understanding culture, and Mario, you and I have talked offline about this before, all culture is local. So your question could be more around culture transformation and how do I do that? And it sounds like it's a long process. And you're right. The average culture transformation can take two to three years. So I am not here on this podcast to say that there is a silver bullet or a magic wand. But the first thing is first, if you are a formal leader in a business capacity, the awareness of knowing that you have your own local culture is everything. Our biggest partner, who's a top airline in the world, people always ask us about their culture. What's it like? You coach all and consult with their 6,000 leaders. And we say, I don't know. 
tell me who the leader is, tell me the market, what floor of the building they're on. And I tell you what that culture is. So let's just level set here. If you're trying to transform a culture through a silver bullet or magic wand, that's just not how it works. There's articles that say the contrary. We will say there are simple steps that you can start off with today. And I'll share a few of those quick hits, but the acknowledgement that there are micro cultures within the grander culture of every organization and each leader has their own. So that, that's piece number one is that acknowledgement and awareness. So here's the vision and it backs into behaviors. The goal for bottom line performance, and I'll just share this with you and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you had a team, imagine you and your former role, Mario, your VP of sales, imagine you back in that space. And the majority, if not all of your team members were inspired to go to work. They felt valued while they were at work. They felt they made an impact every single day while they were at work and they left work fulfilled. Do you think that would have a positive correlation to your bottom line performance in your former VP of sales role? Well, even now as a CEO of Ingresso, 100%, right? I mean, there are individuals in times past, past roles, likely even within Ingresso that may not say all three of those things that you just mentioned in, in a total perspective. Part of that, I believe, is the culture and the leadership. And the other part is the individual mindset, right? And sometimes we have to make decisions in like in past roles where I was always considered the turnaround guy, right? Mm -hmm. So I came in to an organization that was always underperforming and had to take it from the bottom to the top. Unfortunately, not every person on those teams or those organizations were people that were needed to be part of the go forward team, right? Just based upon right. performance or mindset or capability set or whatever it might be. So absolutely the Nirvana state was when you got to the top, what was the unique item? And I would argue that everybody felt like they were fulfilled, felt like they were doing the right things, felt like they wanted to, felt like they wanted to support you as a leader to be able to press forward. I, I would say it was centered around culture and aptitude for certain and their own individual mindset. Yeah. And, and now you tie that back to, we always hear the saying that what's your number one resource and most, regardless of their background, whether they're super technical, data-driven, analytical, or they're, the, they're more conceptual style, everybody comes back to people. One of my biggest challenges is attracting the best talent and then on the back end, retaining them. And so now how does this all tie into that? And I'll share a quick story from my NBA days in basketball. The NBA league office puts a study out there and this will speak directly to sales. This was the business development office within the NBA. And they said, if a year one sales rep, let's call them college analogy. Let's call a year one sales rep, a freshman, a year two, a sophomore, a year three, a junior, a year four, a senior. Got it. Did a study on the average revenue performance of freshmen versus sophomores versus juniors versus seniors. One, two, three, four. A junior had four times the revenue production. A third year sales rep had four times the revenue production in sports, in basketball, than a first year. So now the, the silver bullet was, well, shoot, how the heck do we get more people to hang on for three years? Because the average sales rep was 1.2 years at that time. Mm. So now you tie this back to if the intentional outcome, tying this back to our motto of people-centric culture, driving the intentional outcomes, if the biggest need is to attract and retain the best talent and to reduce that turnover, which in sales is such a challenge. It's such a problem. I definitely struggled with it from my time overseeing sales teams. And so that's really where we come into the, how do people feel when they are in the office? Do they feel valued? Do they have that impact? Where is that purpose? And so going back to your question on what are the simple things that you can do to build trust, create those relationships? How do you build that culture of accountability, which is a huge thing in sales, and we would share that unless you have intrinsic motivation from your sales team or your team in general, nothing is sustainable. You're going to burn through people. You're going to have short-term results and then you're going to have to rehire and it's a vicious cycle over and over and over. So now it becomes, how do you create that culture of accountability and trust? And there's a couple of simple steps that 
we would walk folks through. For one, at an overarching scale, the goal and the purpose has to be clearly defined. So Ernst & Young did a business case for purpose piece. This is last year in conjunction with HBR. It's a fantastic read for those that are uh, wanting to check out that white paper. And essentially, they came up with a piece of what is the business case for purpose? And if people are not tied to the overarching meaning of the organization, they're never going to run through a wall for it. And the scary stat there, Mario, only 38% of employees throughout the U.S., this is a survey to tens of thousands of people at all levels of organizations, not only were 38% aligned with the purpose, over 50% didn't know what the organization's purpose was. Mm. So now you're, you're thinking, I know that sounds like a North Star piece, but the key here is if you're trying to win the game, but purpose is the meaning behind the game, you're just going to care more when you understand what the game is. Most companies, they give you the playbook, they tell you to go execute, and you're not even tied in to the mission, vision, and values of the organization. So that is a starter, and that is not a one-day wonder. But without that foundation of the pyramid, what are you really going to build on? Mm, that's a great point. And it's amazing to me how many, even in my own days, when I go back into working for Fortune 100s, we had a purpose, we had a mission, we had a vision at the local level, and it brings me back to something you said earlier, which I, you kind of skimmed right over. I don't know if people really heard what you said. You can actually, within a company, within a building, within two floors, have two totally different cultures that are existing there within the company, and one could be an extremely good culture, and then the other one right before below it could be the extremely bad culture. And a lot of it tied back to, as I think about this, I knew what our local purpose, mission, and vision was. But whenever we did these calls with our senior executive team, which was once a quarter, we really never understood, like, what do you want us to do? We all have a number. Okay, yeah, we're going to hit the number. Fantastic. But give me more than that. Like, bring life back into this. Bring something personal back into this. And that's where you talk about, you know, this purpose concept that I really appreciate. But, you know, before you go on with point number two and three, here's what I want to do right now. Everyone listening in, listen in to this message from our podcast sponsor. Do you feel like your sales team spends more time updating and completing administrative tasks than they do engaging with customers? CRM was supposed to automate the sales process, but instead created more manual processes. SAP Sales Cloud introduces modern CRM to the industry so that you can sell more and enable your team to be more efficient, effective, and intelligent. SAP Sales Cloud offers solutions to optimize your sales process, accelerate quotes and contracts, and enable corporate learning. No matter what industry you're in, you can build processes around what your salespeople do best. With SAP Sales Cloud, sales as you know it is about to change. Learn more by visiting calidusclouddotcom forward slash Vengresso today. That's C-A-L-L-I-D-U-S cloud.com forward slash V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O. Right before the break there, Paul, we were talking about purpose, mission, vision, values, that nobody really understood that. And you were going to go into a couple more points there in terms of different types of steps. I think you mentioned four steps. And I truly believe that some of the challenges that organizations face is that those that are in the Eiffel Tower, if you would, <laughs> the seat at the top 37th floor, they really aren't hardwiring culture into the organization. They don't think about how does everybody matter? How can they truly bring in the power of family into an organization? But those are my personal philosophies. And you were going to be talking about a couple more things too, that which I want to incorporate into that piece I just mentioned into your next couple items you were, going to, you were giving just a second ago. Sure. So we started, and this is again, how to create that accountability and culture. So with the first being the goals and purpose being clearly defined, the second is personal engagement. So I, I could categorize that as autonomy. When people have a choice in what they do, 
their fingerprints are on the blueprint versus living in a culture, a local culture where they say, here's your playbook, go execute. When you have folks take part in creating that playbook with their leader, you want to talk partnership. You want to talk, I'd run through a wall for you. I'm going to believe in the outcome of something that I had a say in. So that's the second one is you have to personally engage your team in the strategy, in decisions. Otherwise, if you're just feeding them a playbook, you're going to feed into the number one reason people leave companies. And this is true, pure source data from Gallup. 80% of the reason people leave companies is their boss. Mm. You are a boss that does not include me in the process. And we don't have a relationship And we've never had a beer together. And all of these things that may or may not matter to some folks, we all have unique tastes, four out of five times, there's the exit door. So personal engagement is huge. Then I would go to system alignment. We all have things, and pardon my French, but we all have things that piss us off at work. Usually there can be frustrating systems or processes, and we get told, well, that's just the way it's always been. (laughs) And so problem is, especially if you're on the front lines, is anybody asking them what frustrates them? Is anybody in leadership trying to mitigate that or eliminate that? Imagine the magic that can happen. And that is a quick fix. That is sourcing feedback, asking for it, and acknowledging it, letting them know what your opinion is about it after you've processed it. And if you can make small changes, micro changes in the culture of your organization, your people will feel so valued. So everybody says, what's the secret sauce? Empathetic listening and creating a culture of open feedback can change the game. And that 37th floor on the ivory tower that you described, that is one of the flaws is many times listening and feedback at most, and this is a compliment. These are the best cultures. At most, they're cascading down one level in the organization. How often is the C-suite meeting with two levels below, nevertheless, front lines? Now you have these local cultures and they don't even talk to each other. And you wonder why they're silos. This is all an ecosystem. And this is where we tie culture back to performance. You say, well, Paul, you're touching on so many things. And that's because Culture is very, very wide and it's very dynamic and there is no silver bullet. But if you can start with listening and sourcing feedback and having healthy relationships, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Actually, I want to comment because earlier I called it the Eiffel Tower. (laughs) So all my listeners, (laughs) all my listeners are probably like, I said ivory. (laughs) I meant ivory tower. I meant ivory tower. That's bloopers of live recording, right? (laughs) Um, <laughs> thanks for just like smoothing that over my friend like you're just like eh, the folks you talked about in the ivory tower that's yeah. what i meant all right but going back to something you mentioned about the systems alignment right mm-hmm. and sourcing feedback and making small changes i think you called it micro changes like things that you can make a small impact like every one of those small things adds up right to the overall like oh, okay the organization's listening ah oh, okay things are getting better right But there's something that I believe that this one is a two-way street, in my opinion. And the two-way street is there are many people who believe that someone should be fixing these problems. Uh But most oftentimes, you don't know it's a problem because no one's telling you it's a problem. And I believe, and maybe this is a culture thing, maybe organizations need to open it up with, we don't know everything, but when you find the zit, tell us and we'll put some clear cell on it, right? And you're responsible for helping to fix the problem. And a great example is something that just happened this morning. One of our directors identified that an account got was assigned it to, first it was uh, Kurt, and then it got moved to Chuck, and then it got moved to Angela. And both people were now engaging inside of the account and you know, trying to figure out like, why did you assign this account? And I wrote back, I didn't make the assignment. I do not get into our CRM tool and actually change account assignments. It was done automatically. We need to fix the workflow that was broken that moved the accounts and now that required you guys to fix that. And so I'm going to call my boy out here. I won't won't name the name of who it was, but he responded back with, okay, well, you know, this is a smaller account anyways, and I'm okay. You know, I've got a lot of stuff I'm working on. So why don't you just let the other person have it and we'll be good. So, and I said, I wrote back, no, 
The problem started as a result of a workflow engine that's happening from automation. Fix that first, and once we fix that, this will never happen again, so we don't have to think about this going forward, right? And while he did bring it up, oftentimes, whether it was this circumstance or many other circumstances, oftentimes what happens is, is most people will you know, just do the handoff and walk away, but I believe that you have a responsibility, whether or not you're an owner in the company or not. If you're working there, you have a responsibility to make your life better, and if you see it's broken, think through fast forward to all the pieces of how to actually not let it happen again. And so the again piece is what I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. And also you gotta be vocal. And to my own probably, I guess, bad reputation that I sometimes often developed was I was just like a shark. Whenever I found broken things, I'd just be like, this has gotta be fixed, it's gotta be fixed. And I'd just be on it, on it, on it, on it, on it until it was fixed because it was like, this is stopping us from selling. And so I really do believe that leaders have to understand they need to get source feedback. But guess what? If feedback's not happening, then you need to have an open culture, an open relationship that someone else can actually point it out to you and then ask for it to be fixed. And that's appropriate. And you got to bring it up. Am I wrong? No, 100% right. And I think, A, it's about trust because leaders have to be vulnerable. If you are not willing to be vulnerable, so many folks say, oh, things are good. Things are good. Things are perfect. You know what? Maybe, but it's unlikely. Are you asking those questions? And once you ask those questions, do people trust you enough to open up or do they feel there's going to be repercussions or negative consequences for saying, hey boss, here's something. If you candidly mean it and you want that feedback to improve the organization, go for it. But if you're not ready for it or if somebody else told you to do it and you don't believe in it, It is just like having a mission statement that are words on a wall that you don't have behaviors to back it up. It actually hurts you more than helps you. And and so I think you're right. You talk about building cultures of resiliency and and that's something we always hear. Well, that's a byproduct of trust. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) and this brings up another, and I'll use again, real life scenarios here. A couple weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, I sent a note off to our social media coordinator, Travis, and I said, Travis, I said, why did you do this? I thought I've asked now, and we've documented three times not to do this from social media perspective. And he wrote back, what are you talking about? I followed your instructions. And I wrote back, no, that's not what I asked. I asked for this to do blah, 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 blah. And he sent me an email, which had my actual words on it that said, do this. And then I quickly realized I was calling it a comment, whereas opposed to it should have been called a status post. So what I was interpreting in my head as instructions of not to do something, it was clear. I said, let's not do this. Make it part of the comment. But in the world of social media, the comment is is actually as a sub comment, not actually as a status post, right? But what I was really trying to say was, make it part of the status post, but I used Mm. the wrong terminology. So he followed it to the T and he (laughs) came back to me and he's like, I'm really unclear what you're trying to tell me that I did wrong because this is what you wrote. And I was like, no, okay, I get it. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm wrong. My total bad. When I said this, I was using the word common to mean status post. I didn't think that you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this is that I think being vulnerable where the leader has got to like, I could have also said, all right, thanks so much, you know, for clarification, keep on doing what you're doing. Right. However, I had to acknowledge that, man, I totally screwed up and you're right. I was totally wrong. And more importantly, I led you astray by using the wrong word, right? Because I had it in my mind. And I think that's part of, you know, where on the backside, Travis will probably listen to this, this, this show and he'll probably be like, yeah, see, I was smiling <laughs> on the backside and I did want to tell you, you bonehead, right? I wanted to be like, I listened to your instructions. What's wrong with you? But that's part of that being vulnerable as well and making sure that people understand that, you know, we're human and we make mistakes and I was totally in the wrong. Hey, I'm not going to sit here and say right or wrong, but I I think you bring us to great points of, at the end of the day, if you have that core relationship, a lot of this stuff smooths over. If I know somebody in my span of care or my leader, everything you just described, we're going to get through it. The challenge we see is when you don't have that core relationship, when that trust is not in place, the smallest things become big things. And you do that over a cycle of time 
And that's what leads to a lack of engagement. That's what leads to turnover. That's why we're in this vicious cycle of chasing talent and try to hold on to them. And here's an interesting one for you too, Marion. Here's another one on accountability is what are we doing in the middle in the sense of we focus so much on the recruitment side of talent. We are upset at the challenges we have on the back end when there's turnover. So we struggle with retention. But what are we doing to actually develop our talent while they're in our span of care? When things are still good, before this downslope of engagement comes, and you and I have had other conversations where we talked about the value of coaching. And so this ties back to, well, when I was a doer, my manager always put out my fires and I went to them with a problem and they solved it for me. We actually see that chief problem solving officers are part of the problem with bad cultures in the sense of when you are putting people's problems out consistently, they become dependent. And there's sometimes where there is an expertise level that is necessary. Hey, I'm day one on the job. You have 10 years of experience. I am going to lean on you. I'm talking a more advanced, dynamic, problem-solving case. By you as my coach, I report to you, Mario, you helping me see differently, think differently, asking me the right questions. You are now maximizing my talent, my gifts, my abilities, and as a result, you're going to have a healthier, more thriving, and higher performing organization. But the problem is, again, going back to 58% of leaders have never received leadership training. This is what leadership training will teach you. I myself, who didn't have a lot early in my career, I was the king chief problem solving officer. And reflecting back, if I could do one of a few things differently, that would be at or near the top of my list. I didn't spend enough time listening to my people. I wasn't vulnerable enough to make, or excuse me, admit mistakes. And I was always being a chief problem solving officer, mitigating the gifts and talents of my team. So that, that's me looking in the mirror saying that. And that's why I say it was such passion and pride for everybody out there listening. Uh, very interesting. So in other words, leaders should taper back their desire to solve a problem for somebody and empower those individuals to help solve the problem themselves? Yep. You've heard the quote of teach a man to fish, feed themselves the rest of their life, or do you want to catch every fish for them forever? In that context, it makes sense. But yet in business, we literally walk them through catching the fish every single time and sometimes do it for them. And we wonder why they're not growing, developing. And Mario, that is, I shared earlier, the top reason people leave 80% is their boss. Number two reason people leave organizations is a lack of professional and personal development. They don't feel like they're getting better. And so they feel stagnant. And then people always say, well, I want to grow. I want to grow. And we as leaders hear that. And if we do nothing about it, think of how frustrating that can be from the other's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting because uh, in times past where, you know, I went from one company to another, I had friends, relationships, people obviously kept up with where I was. And uh, a couple of folks actually came to me when in the new organization and said, I can't say with the culture that I'm in, like, I got to move out. And I understood that because that was one of the reasons why I left, right? It was just like, it was a horrible dying culture. When I started the company, there was 80,000 employees. When I left, there were 40,000 employees. So, you know, to see in a period of 14 years or 10 years, excuse me, a culture that have a 50% reduction in people and personnel. I mean, you could look to your left and you look to your right. And definitely one of those people are going to be gone. Right. And so it was funny because when they came to me, I said, sure, I'll absolutely, here's what we're looking for. Here's what we're doing. And you can come work for us. And when I left my previous leader, who I used to report to, he was so angry that I recruited people away, which were his, some of his top people, but I didn't recruit them away. These individuals came to me because not because of the other leadership, meaning their direct boss, because he was a great leader. Rather, it was the culture of the company. It was a dying culture of that particular company. And nobody was doing anything to help solve that particular problem because it was out of the control of the first line, second line, and even fourth line managers, right? I'm like, these are decisions being way up at the top that they needed to do from a financial perspective. So, you know, it's like, 
I have a job. Six months later, I may not have a job. Do people want to sit there and have that type of pressure on them when they want to move forward in their lives? But nonetheless, it was, it was interesting because that was one of the challenges. The other one was the individuals that came said, I'm stuck here. I won't have an opportunity to move here. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're not growing, they're shrinking. So my (laughs) professional development will never achieve where I want to go as a result of being in this organization. And that's super important that people realize that, that in a shrinking organization, in this particular circumstance, that professional development was the second most important reason why somebody wanted to leave because they didn't see that there was opportunity Mm -hmm. to grow. Yeah. Mario, you bring us to a great place where So if the talent wheel starts with recruitment and then it goes into onboarding and then it's development and it closes with retention, what's in between development and retention is evaluation. Mm -hmm. And that's another big thing that we see is do people know what success looks like in their role, in the organization? What do you expect from them? So in the sales world, yes, there's a pretty transparent scoreboard, I would hope, in most cultures. I could tell who's in first, who's in the opposite, et cetera. But then that person doesn't grow. They don't get promoted. They wonder why. They say, I've been a top two performer. There's folks that are a dozen ranks below. Well, are we communicating what else success looks like? What else we expect from them? And that becomes another source of frustration that we see in cultures, good versus other, is the best cultures have very clear KPIs, both quantitative and qualitative. They are super intentional with what they expect from you from a value standpoint. Here are our corporate values, and we are going to, in our performance reviews, talk about collaboration, talk about trust, talk about all of these other things they expect on top of the quantitative scoreboard. So I think that's an interesting one where in sports, they always tell you what the score is, and it's pretty black and white problem with business is it gets a little bit more gray. The way people are promoted in many times, it's not black and white, it's gray, but we don't communicate what gray looks like. And so people are just kind of running in the field without a direction. So, you know, just wanted to provide that as another example of good versus bad. I want to sum this up in terms of some of the things that you talked about today. And it really comes down to organizations need to think about how the leaders of the organization can help the company achieve building a culture of, I think you said accountability, Mm -hmm. building high performance teams. And we're not talking about just sales teams. We're talking about whether that's the accounting team or facilities team, right? Teams in general, transformational change to achieve a specific mission, purpose, vision, core values, whatever it might be that the organization is trying to do. And I think one of the things you mentioned on this transformational change is God, People don't even know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So let's make sure that they know so they can bust through a wall for you for that change. And then the piece that we didn't get to talk too much about was attracting and retaining talent, which we talked a little bit about. And some of the things are behind lack of personal professional development. 80% of people leave because of their boss. But like those four components that you just mentioned, did I get all that right in terms of like the things that you are focused on? and helping organizations to think about, and those four things that organizations should be thinking about, whether it's the sales department or whether it's the company at a company level, should be thinking about to be able to take the company to the next level. Yeah, I think you hit on all the pillars and and just to simplify it is start with purpose. If you can build that foundational purpose, everything grows on top of that. And then you have the ability to build an culture of accountability, a culture of high trust, which will lead to that culture of resiliency. We always say inspiration gets you to take the first step. Trust is what gets you to weather the storm, right? And in business, you're usually weathering some sort of storm. So that's why we always come back to that. And now you have the potential to go through that transformational change. The one piece to touch on there is If you push change on others, it has no chance of being sustained because you never explained the why behind it. Part of transformational change is see it from everybody else's point of view. When I was told what needs to change, which was either do more, do better, do different, 
it was always pushed on me. Nobody ever asked what I thought of it, but I was the one accountable to execute it. So I just want to, you know, share that with the group as well. And all of that, Mario, it leads to attracting and retaining the best talent because nowadays the transparency around a platform like a glass door, what are employees saying about you? If I called your employees, just a metaphor here, that's your locker room. What's the locker room say? And now as a potential recruit, I can source feedback from your locker room on the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. There's full visibility. So doing all of those things gives you the best chance to have a lot of great micro cultures, local cultures, so that the universal culture is best portrayed on a glass door. And now people want to work there. They're inspired. They're valued. They have high impact. They have purpose. And then they're fulfilled when they go home. And that's another thing too, Mario, is for everybody out there, yes, we focus today on a lot of professional aspects. If you're doing training and leadership right, that trickles out to every other aspect of your life. When people are inspired values, they feel impact and they're fulfilled. That makes them better. Husbands, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, you name it. We all know work comes home with us. So I view this as a very altruistic thing of, yes, it's about bottom line performance, but man, if it could also do good in my personal life, if it could create better relationships, family, friends, all that, talk about a win-win. It starts professional, but it 100%. The biggest pieces of, of recognition and thank you that we get is how we made life better outside of work, even though we trained them professionally. I love it. Fantastic. Well, there you have it. Words of wisdom from Paul Epstein with BWLI. And uh, Paul, if someone wants to uh, reach out to you is the best way, what, Twitter, LinkedIn, email, what's the best way to get a hold of you? LinkedIn would be the best, uh, definitely. And so I'll spell out my name and I'll also give my email, which would be tremendous as well. So P-A-U-L dot E-P-S-T-E-I-N at B-W-L-I dot com or just find me on LinkedIn, Paul Epstein with the BW Leadership Institute. And I learned this one from you, Mario. Love to take the, uh, the all the connections that we get from online to offline. So there that's Gresso 101 right there. So it's- <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. So make sure you, when you reach out to Paul, send him a personalized LinkedIn connection request. Tell him you heard him on Selling with Social. And that's Paul Epstein with E-P-S-T-E-I-N. And it'll be inside the show notes as well. Paul, I have one last question for you, my friend. Uh, we're running out of time here. And so all-time favorite movie, what is it? Well, I opened up the call talking about something not on my LinkedIn profile and it tied back to Vegas. So I'll keep it consistent because one of my all-time favorites is part one, the original Hangover. <laughs> nothing better, I man. Like, you, yeah, you, you know it, right? It's just such a phenomenal <laughs> and, thing. And then you ended up married. <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. I think that's a mic drop right there, Mario. That's it. Mr. Epstein, thank you so much for joining me here on Selling with Social. All of you listening in, stay tuned for this message right now. Thanks so much for joining me on that episode of Selling with Social. I hope you found as much value in that episode as I did. Here's what I want you to do next. Please go to www.vengresso.com. That's V N G R E. V-E-N-G-R-E-S-O.com. And make sure that you get access to our content. We've got the latest and greatest in digital sales, sales training, content marketing, and social selling strategies that are going to help you grow your sales pipeline. I look forward to having you on the next show of Selling with Social. Make sure you also go to vengresso.com forward slash podcast to be able to get access to the latest and greatest Selling with Social episodes along with any of the other episodes that we've got from Social Business Engines with my friend and partner, Bernie Borges. Thanks again for joining on Selling with Social. This podcast was brought to you by SAP Sales Cloud. Here's what I want you to do right now. Learn more about SAP Sales Cloud by visiting calidascloud.com forward slash 
Ben Gresso. That's C A L L I D U S cloud.com forward slash B E N G R E S O.